All right, everybody. Um, we, I see that there are still some people joining in now, but we are five minutes past the time. So maybe that's a good time to begin. Um, my name is Stellan Windhagen. Um, I'm a professor of uh, sociology and um, endowed chair in the study of nonviolent direct action and civil resistance at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, and I'm happy to introduce today um, a, a part of our webinar series with Professor Farin Parvez, which is focusing on uh, international debt resistance. Um, I also want to say that uh, we have a next webinar coming up on May 13, which we will mention a little bit more and also post uh, information about in the chat, uh, which you can register to. So this is part of the Resistance Studies Initiative's critical engagement with resistance together with scholars and activists. Um, and today then the theme is, is around uh, international debt resistance. So um, I'm very happy to have uh, Professor Farin Parves with us um, who has been doing um, interviews uh, with people engaging with the problems and the repression of debt, as well as what they're trying to do in engaging against it um, in India. And we will then hear from um, Professor Parves uh, first for um, uh, an introduction uh, lecture, and then we will have questions and time for discussions. Um, so you can fill in in the Q&A uh, or you can do it directly in the chat with questions. Um, as, as long as the, the talk is going on, you can just post these things and, and I'll make sure we, we get to these discussions, uh, questions along the way. So with that, uh, I would like to give the word over to uh, Professor Parvez. Uh, thank you so much for uh, uh, doing this uh, webinar for the Resistance Studies Initiative. And I also want to highlight that uh, Professor Parvez is, is also um, a fellow with the Resistance Studies Initiative, besides being a colleague of mine in sociology department. So welcome so much, Farin Parvez. Thank you. Um, it's really wonderful to be here and thank you all for coming. Let me go ahead and share my screen. But, yeah, thank you for coming to this talk, um, to Debbie for organizing um, the series and um, Stellan for inviting me to, to share some of my work and encouraging me to do this, um, even though I'm, I'm relatively new to this subject area and I cannot claim to be an expert. Um, so I very much you know, want to invite you all to kind of think with me on this topic. Um, so I'm coming to this topic from a few different angles uh, as a researcher in the global south, um, specifically of India, on predatory informal lending, and I look specifically at Muslim and, and Dalit families. Um, so my work over the last couple of years has been on micro level household debt. And I've also been working in a group called the Debt Justice Working Group, um, which is part of an organization called the Progressive International. And we've been thinking through how to create a coherent uh, narrative that identifies the complex set of problems we're confronting around the world related to debt, how to connect these, um, and then actually propose a set of solutions. And it's very much a work in progress. Um, so how did I arrive at this topic? Um, There we go. Um, so it was during one of my fieldwork visits for my previous research, which is um, based in the city of Hyderabad, India, towards the south. Um, in 2009, there was a major incident here where a young woman named Samita was pushed off of the, the top of this um, central city monument by an illegal financer, and she died in hospital a couple of days later. And the story is that this man had lent uh, 14,000 rupees, which is about $200, to Samina's mother who needed a loan for the type of piecemeal textile work that she did, um, basically sewing mirrors onto, onto dresses. So when he started harassing the mother for interest payments, Samina said, 
I'll take care of it, meaning she would have a sexual relationship with this financer. And there are conflicting claims about what they were fighting about, but he later confessed to pushing her off the monument. Um, and he was jailed for three months only before getting released. So after this case, there was a public outcry in the city over the problem of debt and illegal finance because it is, it is rampant. So with the story in my mind and in reading regular media reports about cases like this, I, I wanted to understand the reasons that people go to these lenders and more broadly, the, the social ecology of, of household debt. And then I eventually started learning more about how this is actually a widespread uh, international issue and that it connects to the macro level structures of states and, and financialized capitalism. So elaborating these connections is, is a challenge, which is a point that I'll come back to. Um, so just to give you a few numbers, between 2010 and 2020, the public debt of developing countries has increased from an average of 40% to 62% of GDP. In South Asia and in Sub-Saharan Africa, governments spend more than double the amount on external debts than on healthcare. Um, at the micro level, household debt as a percent of GDP rose over the last decade, most significantly from 25% to 40% among countries classified as emerging economies, which includes India. Um, so in the US, total household debt has reached almost $14 trillion, and student debt is now $1.7 trillion. This is a 100% increase just in the last decade. Um, this, this graph just shows you the kind of rising percent of, uh, of households that, that are carrying student debt. So um, I'm going to take you through a kind of whirlwind journey through, through different examples of, of debt resistance. And I'll cover a few analytical points along the way about the types of strategies that have worked. Um, so my plan for this talk is to give a little bit of context and theoretical background on debt, and then uh, a broad overview of international debt resistance, where I'll point to a few examples. And then I'm going to focus on three recent examples of relatively successful debt resistance uh, movements in different parts of the world. And these are from Bolivia, from Spain, and from the US on the issue of, of student debt. I'm then going to present some of my research on India. And I think diving into the, the specificity of, of that case shows the complexities of debt, um, very different ways of thinking about resistance. And just to be clear, um, the, the India research is my original research. The rest of what I'm presenting is based on, on secondary readings. And then I'll pull together some threads and conclude with, uh, with the challenges and also the potential for a mass global debtors movement, which I'm going to leave as more of an open question rather than an answer. So there's a large literature on the social and economic anthropology of debt. David Graeber's work is among the best known in the literature. Um, some of the themes that have been emphasized in anthropology are that debts between people have been part of community life since some of the earliest societies that we know of. Debt has to do with relationships and intimacy. It enables important life opportunities such as rituals and celebrations to having a comfortable home and, and living a life of, of dignity. But in many times and places, relationships of indebtedness have been based on exploitation, extraction, sexual violence, and, and loss of freedom. Today, in the era of neoliberal states and financialized capitalism, it's been argued that debt is one of the driving forces of the, for the reproduction of capitalism. I won't go into this right now, but I, I can do my best to explain a bit about what that means during the discussion. So at the macro level, um, neoliberal governments, or what Wolfgang Strick has labeled the debt state, fund a significant portion of their expenditures through debt rather than tax revenue, while at the same time privatizing many of their functions. So with the privatization of social goods, access to credit has become essential for people to acquire things like healthcare and education. 
we can think of this as an inverted direction of, of redistribution. In other words, a transfer of wealth from society to creditors and the state toward credit-led accumulation. The social rights like employment and healthcare have become social debts. So if you think about it, you have to take on debt in order to get an education, in order to get a job, in order to be exploited, in order just to live your life. Um, so scholars have recharacterized welfare states as debt-fair states and the financialized economy as a debt economy. The availability of credit or the so-called democratization of credit has obscured deepening inequality and wage stagnation while the wealthiest households have enjoyed high savings and in turn a surplus of cash that they want to invest. So as a result, societies around the world have seen a powerful comeback of, of a class of rentiers. So financialized capitalism is an expression of class power and domination and a method of social control. So many households across the global north and south have gone into massive amounts of debt to meet their basic needs. And research shows that people take loans uh, primarily for the purpose of, of social reproduction, including household needs, marriage, and health. There's a body of literature on the financialization of everyday life, which explores how people become incorporated into the debt economy through things like microfinance or home mortgages. So for the masses of workers in many countries, they rely on unpredictable daily wages, therefore easily accessible loans, which are often at predatory interest rates become essential to their survival. Everything from pawn shops to payday loans to the local loan shark uh, become important. In some cases, the financial technology industry has made it possible to acquire loans immediately through phone apps. This is a relatively recent phenomena. From Kenya to Indonesia, this has led to extreme over-indebtedness. And that has various uh, consequences for people, like harassment by lenders, um, when payments stretch out over years or, or the course of a lifetime, individuals and families may begin to see their futures as foreclosed. So time in the sense of having possibilities and choices in the future appears to collapse. Scholars have described this as the deferment of life um, and financial melancholia. It's been linked to mental health crises and in some cases around the world to, to suicides. So debt also works on our subjectivity, um, a very sense of, of who we think we are, um, where individuals feel guilty and individually responsible for, for being in debt. And then finally, at the level of communities, scholars like David Graeber uh, argued that monetary debts can undermine human relations, um, infusing relationships with distrust. So building on Marx, some people have connected credit debt relations to the concept of alienation. So what am I referring to by, by international debt resistance? Um, so I'm gonna focus on the current moment, the last 10 years or so. Although debt resistance throughout history you know, has taken many forms from demands for debt forgiveness in ancient Babylon um, to IMF riots in the 1980s, which had brought millions of people into the streets. Um, so I think there are three components of, of debt resistance in my understanding. Um, first, there's, there's the, the ideological work of shifting the understanding of debt from an individual shortcoming to a collective problem, and ultimately as a form of collective power against the financial system. Number two, there is challenging the state, banks, and international institutions and holding them accountable. Um, and the third piece is, is building up alternatives to debt in monetary currency. And I unfortunately won't say too much about this, this last piece, but I'm, I'll touch on it at, at the end. Um, so in terms of the, in, the ideological work, one of the, the primary goals is to construct debt resistance as an internationalist 
project. So to see the, the struggles of an American student debtor as fundamentally connected to those of a, <clears throat> of a woman in Kenya trying to pay a medical debt. And building this kind of solidarity is a critical first step in this movement. One of the most insidious aspects of indebtedness is the guilt and shame that people feel for having debt and being unable to pay it. And this can be a very isolating experience that prevents mobilization. So this ideological work happens in communities, on social media, in academic and activist writing. It includes questioning the moral legitimacy of debts, um, questioning the need to repay, showing how debt is related to racial inequality, pointing to the unfairness that um, corporations get debt forgiveness often and, and debt restructuring, whereas the people often do not. So these are just some elements of, of trying to shift the public consciousness. And I think the examples I'll give um, will illustrate this. So in terms of challenging the state and banks, um, the, the, there's plenty of resistance on the ground and by different types of organizations and, and nonprofits. Um, some of the most effective examples, I think, have involved direct action. And these are not actually documented very well. So I'll give you just a few examples as, as part of this very broad uh, overview. So, so the first is actually debt strikes or refusals to pay. Um, in a number of places, these have led to some reforms in, in debt cancellations. So some of these come from um, the, the microcredit phenomenon. Some of you, I'm, I'm sure, know that microcredit was, was supposed to empower poor people in the global south, especially women. Um, it ended up becoming a predatory, exploitative system that undermined borrows, borrowers through lots of different, uh, through different mechanisms. In Nicaragua in 2008, um, microlenders had actually imprisoned a number of borrowers, and so there were major protests, um, and I believe some, some burning down of, of some of the microfinance offices um, under the banner, no, no pago, I'm, I'm not paying. Um, so as a result of this, the debtors were actually released from prison, and, and many never ended up uh, repaying their debts. In India in 2010, um, protesters came out after a wave of, of suicides among microfinance clients. Um, there were at least a couple hundred, perhaps more, of, of suicides. Um, so the state government, the, the state of Andhra Pradesh, um, agreed to regulate abusive lenders, and they abolished more than $1 billion in, in loans. So these refusals to pay have been successful in, in some places. Um, another example is um, Iceland's kitchenware revolution. Uh, I've also seen it called saucepan revolution. So during the financial crisis after 2008, which was a crisis brought on by private banks, people revolted in what was basically a debtor's revolt. So crowds came out um, banging pots and pans in, in Parliament Square in Reykjavik, and the government was forced to respond um, it led to a citizens' assembly, um, some amount of debt relief, the arrests of a number of, um, of bankers, I believe, and, and it forced a revision of, of the Constitution. The long-term effects of this are, are, remain unclear, but um, at the moment, it, it was a very powerful movement. Um, so other strategies in campaigns that did not necessarily involve demonstrations are demands for forensic debt audits from, from governments. So this is one strategy that movements have pursued. Um, the idea being that the government has to show exactly where national debts originated so that people become aware of the corruption behind some of these debts. The Philippines has one of the longest running campaigns for debt audits. In Jamaica, where the government spends twice as much on foreign debts than on education and health combined, the campaign revealed that about 70% of debts were illegitimate, um, basically involving bribes, or they were contracted with private companies but became public debts. And so showing this illegitimacy um, provides the moral backing for refusals to pay. 
Um, and the concept of illegitimacy is, is something maybe we can, we can talk about later. Um, and then there are legal strategies. So um, these are sometimes at the level of international campaigns like the Jubilee Debt Coalition, which is based in the UK um, and has pushed for legislation against vulture funds and for more robust debt relief. And then there's the level of community organizing and there are various types of legal efforts. So for example, in Sierra Leone, um, there's a group that gives legal assistance to women debtors who actually have been imprisoned for, for small amounts of debt. We don't think of debtors prisons as actually existing today and yet they do in, in disguised forms. So here in the US, um, the use of fees in, in preventing prisoner reentry and actually carving a path back into prison for many people is not uncommon. Um, this slide shows the, uh, the specific states where um, there is something called criminal justice debt, right? And people are actually channeled back into, into incarceration. Um, so in a way we can view prison abolition work, bail funds, and legal activism against debt-related incarceration is also very much part of, of debt resistance. Um, okay, so what I'm gonna do now is present um, three more examples of debt resistance movements, but in, in a little bit more detail. And the first is from Bolivia. Um, so this uh, started out as a nonviolent movement and then it actually became kind of culminated in, in a moment of, of armed resistance um, that I, I think led to a lot of internal controversy um, about this, this event and, and these, these means. Um, so during the heyday of, of neoliberalism, about 60% of the population was living below the poverty line. Um, it's now about half of that. So Bolivia was actually home to one of Latin America's most successful microfinance industries. Um, there was a kind of wild west of, of lending with banks, you know, especially targeting the poor. By 2000, there was a financial crisis, lending dried up, families were defaulting, and in a number of cases, the banks were actually filing lawsuits against, against debtors and, and taking away their possessions. So in the summer of 2001, Many thousands of indebted workers and farmers from all over the country were coming into the capital of La Paz to protest against the banks. And so this occurred over 95 days, over, over a 95 day period. Um, one of the leaders in this movement was the anarchist feminist collective, uh, Mujeres Creando, Women Creating. And I apologize, I, I don't speak Spanish, unfortunately. Um, so one of their tactics is using street art and so during this three month action in the capital, they used graffiti and, and, and lots of other forms of, of street action. There's a little bit of Spanish language literature on this, but otherwise it's, very, it's been very difficult to find information. So I'm gathering this from a few interviews online as well um, as an Irish anarchist newspaper. So this is an interview with uh, Julieta Ojeda, an active member of the collective. She said, the, the debtors were staying in the university. We held courses explaining which international institutions were financing the Bolivian banks. The debtors had been in La Paz for three months and all that time they didn't get a chance to sit down and be heard by the presidents of the associations of the banks. During this time, many of them fell ill and many had respiratory infections as they had been tear gassed. We published a newspaper with them and sold it together so that the general public would revise their opinion of the debtors. A lot of people were saying that they were good for nothings who just didn't wanna pay their debts. But then people began to realize that it wasn't that simple and that in reality, the financial institutions were committing usury and extortion, cheating people and exploiting their ignorance, making them sign contracts that they didn't understand. On July 2nd, a small group of debtors from, from the larger debtors association, which was, by the way, mostly women, um, decided to occupy the Bolivian Banking Supervisory Agency. 
So they were armed with dynamite and Molotov cocktails to prevent uh, police intervention. So they apparently held hostage um, the bank officials and tied them up alongside bundles of dynamite. It's reported that 94 officials were held hostage. So this picture I found online, um, I believe from a newspaper, you see a, a very sad looking, unfortunate bank official, um, I, I believe with dynamite um, strapped to her. Um, condonación total I, means total forgiveness. Um, so the activists then gave speeches using bullhorns from the balconies of the building. They demanded total debt cancellation and dismissal of the lawsuits. So this forced government officials and banking authorities to negotiate. And they ended up winning a number of concessions, including some cancellation, not total, but some um, suspension of legal action and recognition of these anarchist women as, as the formal negotiators in this process. So Mujeres Creando had a festival of bread and flowers um, that they distributed after the negotiations ended. So a second example comes from Spain, um, specifically a movement called the Platform of People Affected by Mortgages, which is not, not a very elegant um, English translation of, uh, of the name of the movement. Um, I'm presenting this based on research by a uh, French scholar, uh, uh, Quentin Ravelli. And this was, um, again, led largely by women, um, actually racialized migrant women in coalition with uh, construction workers. So it was a very interesting um, class coalition. So during the global financial crisis of 2008 and in the years following, there were 700,000 foreclosures in Spain, more than in the US. So epic unemployment and the collapse of the construction industry. So in 2009, the PAH formed in order to fight evictions, to fight predatory lending, and debts that they argued were, again, illegitimate. Um, Spain had passed this really harsh law where even after being foreclosed, people still had to pay the mortgage loan. So it was very um, draconian law. By 2015, this was a mass movement. Um, they used tactics from bank occupations to economic education workshops, they stopped thousands of evictions. Um, they helped develop affordable rental housing. And they tried to promote structural explanations rather than individualized explanations for, for people's economic suffering during the crisis. So among the movement's successes have been its ability to challenge people's individual guilt and shame about their debts, in addition to building cross-class alliances while having a solid base of, of racialized and migrant women at, at the center of the movement. So they engaged in direct action, physically obstructing evictions. Um, there was legal activism and challenging the legality of the debts. Activists held workshops where they analyzed um, how debts travel. So basically when debts are sold to third parties in the process of, of securitization, um, and so they were emphasizing to people that that the bank doesn't even own their loan anymore. You know, so people basically broke down this very abstract process of, of financialization. And it was the weekly assemblies that that are um, the heart of of this movement. So in these assemblies, people shared their personal stories and struggles with the banks. Um, they discussed how to negotiate with bank officials. Uh, Ravelli calls this uh, political theater. He writes, um, afectados even began to take pride in no longer paying their debts. So one of the pieces of, of their ideological work is also reframing um, debt suicides, not as individual acts, but as, as murder. Um, so there was a suicide of a 43-year-old woman when she was being evicted. And um, activists covered the exterior of the bank with, um, with signs and graffiti, basically calling um, them criminals and, and murderers. Um, so 
So the PAH movement has had a lot of successes, but in some ways we might say it's actually the creation of communities on the ground and, and a collective consciousness around debt that is really the measure of success. So um, the last example, before I jump um, to, to India again, um, the last example I wanna highlight is here from the US <clears throat> and that has to do with the student debt movement, which has largely coalesced under what's called the debt collective. Um, and this is a recent book I highly recommend um, that they just put out it's called uh, Can't Pay, Won't Pay, The Case for Economic Disobedience. So although we have not had um, student debt cancellation yet, um, we might still view it as a successful movement because it's entered the mainstream electoral arena with a number of Democratic Party politicians like Bernie Sanders um, supporting their demands. So, um, so this originated at the end of Occupy Wall Street. And uh, one of the things activists launched was called the Rolling Jubilee. Um, according to um, George Kofensis, this is the Rolling Jubilee is an ingenious political use of the secondary market for defaulted loans that aims to turn financial capital's tools against itself. So this is basically when a loan goes into default, the bank will sell it on the secondary market at a reduced price. And then that party who buys it tries to get the defaulter to pay and, and make as much profit off of them as possible. And so Rolling Jubilee was about buying out these debts and then canceling them. And so they've actually abolished almost $32 million of, of debts. And a lot of these were actually medical debts. So um, as they tried to get people to agree to go into default, basically um, you know, debt refusal, um, one activist said, uh, it was just a deeply powerful and emotional space where people were able uh, to talk about the pain of having debt for the first time and to think about the possibility of resistance. To me, these are the moments in organizing that are the most amazing, where you see people have this experience of being like, oh, this is not my fault. Um, this, is, this was reported um, by a writer in a recent article, and so much of what I'm telling you here actually comes from this article. Um, it's worth pointing out that Americans in particular have, have a moralistic view about repaying debts and, and overcoming this is probably harder in the US than, than in other places, for, for example, in Spain. Um, so these activists started to get increased media attention um, and eventually meeting with Department of Education officials. And so right now it's on the political agenda and we're, we're kind of just waiting to see what, what President Biden will do. In the meantime, there are online activities, political education workshops, advising people on their very specific debt situations. Um, there was a 100 day strike by 100 debtors, um, occasional demonstrations, films and videos, and then the sharing of stories. Um, so one of these, um, asks the question, like, what would you do if your debts were canceled? And so here you have this person um, in Philadelphia with over $250,000 of, of debt. Um, and they say, I could appreciate my education instead of questioning its value. So I think the, these 100 strikers who all agreed to not pay um, uh, came out with you know, answering this question of, of what would you do? I think one of the, the challenges is that it's been relatively easier to win support um, for this movement when the main critique was about fraud. So basically, for-profit colleges, um, you know, some of them ended up in fraudulent degrees um, and other kind of obviously illegitimate debts. The argument about student debt abolition more broadly, I think, has been harder to make to convince people um, when it's not necessarily about fraud. Right. Um, so the debt collective takes a universalist stance that education should be a citizenship right, a public good, and free for everyone. And I think this, this principled stance has actually been one of the strengths of this movement. <clears throat> 
Um, it's important to address the issue of race. So earlier on, um, uh, the movement was called Strike Debt. Um, and I think it kind of stumbled over its, its whiteness. Um, one of the original members, a, a person of color, had made the argument that, you know, the, the hundreds of thousands of dollars that were being collected toward the Rolling Jubilee shouldn't, shouldn't go to essentially paying off debt collectors, but instead to programs such as land trusts in poor racialized communities. Um, and he, he ended up resigning. Um, so my, my impression is, is that it was largely a white movement with white leaders that weren't um, necessarily making these connections to racism, you know, gentrification, the structural in inequities against African-Americans. Um, and yet, you know, student debt is disproportionately high among Black Americans, women, and LGBTQ individuals. So I think the movement did suffer from a sort of colorblind racism um, to not highlight the racial injustice that is very much part of the story of, of student debt. But I think the movement has changed a lot and has started to make these connections, um, which are becoming more kind of um, front and center. So especially with progressive politicians like Nina Turner um, and Ayanna Presley, um, who are lending their voices uh, to, this, to this movement. So I'm going to shift back to the global south, um, looking at very different types of debt um, that involve illegal finance and the informal economy, um, which is uh, perhaps the majority um, of the types of debts in, in the global south. Um, so here I'm going to highlight my own research uh, on the ground. So, um, so India is now the fifth largest economy in the world. And although the economy was growing very fast, um, government services, public goods have stagnated. So housing, education, um, medical care, and sanitation. So India began liberalizing in the 1990s and this ushered in staggering inequalities. According to the World Economic Forum, um, India's richest 1% own 53% of its wealth. And this, this is up from 37% in, in 2000. Um, so I have focused much of my work on, on Muslims who are about 14% of the population. Uh, they are extraordinarily diverse, um, but largely concentrated among the poor classes and are a racialized minority. I think uh, not many people know, um, but Muslims are actually now worse off in some respects than, than Dalits, the, the lowest caste group, in terms of education, work participation, political representation, and, and a few other things. Um, my research is in the urban context, and uh, the city, again, is Hyderabad, which I pointed to in, in my introduction. Um, I did some ethnographic observation in pawnbroker shops with street hawkers and in one squatter community. And this is a picture of, of, that, um, of that squatter community where I worked. Um, I interviewed 75 people, mostly debtors, but a few lenders, some police and activists, all based in these poor neighborhoods. So the men are mostly uh, daily wage workers and women often do um, piecemeal work, um, like in this picture where she sits all day making bracelets, um, where they earn essentially pennies per hour, according to my calculations. Um, <clears throat> so they need to take loans uh, for basic expenses, including just the capital that they need to stay employed on a daily basis. Because they are poor, because there is discrimination against Muslims and Dalits, they don't really have access to regular bank loans. Um, so to give you some sense, I carried out a survey of 101 families. Um, this is just a picture from um, one of the days we were doing the survey um, with two of my uh, research collaborators. Um, and 77% of the families, it was 101 families, uh, reported having taken loans. 
And the top categories of reasons were weddings at 42%, um, their, their capital for their job, 26%, medical treatment, um, which is very significant, followed by household expenses, housing costs, and children's school fees. And so the amount that they borrow is usually at minimum greater than their annual earnings. Um, and sometimes a few times the, the annual earnings. So, so people are very deeply in debt. And um, I argue that this particular economy is on a foundation of debt bondage um, as people get caught in cycles that they can't get out of. Um, and you know, perhaps we can talk if there's time about if that concept actually, you know, in, in, in all the different contexts that that concept can travel of debt bondage. Um, there's also an element of what David Graeber called subjective debt bondage, um, when people see their futures as foreclosed. So for example, um, Zahida, um, a woman, a grandmother who lives in that squatter settlement is continually juggling debts and dealing with harassment from lenders. Um, she has hundreds of thousands of rupees in, in debt. And she says, the money keeps on coming and going. This keeps going on and eventually we'll die like this. We keep on borrowing and paying. That is how we make ends meet. Um, so Zahira is a widow, which means that she's entitled to a widow's pension. Um, and this is a small cash amount that um, she gets from the state government and she uses that word, her interest payments on these debts. So, um, so these very welfare benefits are actually reappropriated in, in a sense um, back into the, um, this class of rentiers. Okay, so this is, um, this is the, an advertisement by the state government, government basically touting um, its cash welfare programs. Um, so the other major thing is the transformation of marriage rituals into a predatory practice. And I'm referring here to the dowry system, which is basically um, the giving of gifts and cash to a groom's family at the time of marriage. So it's turned into a very predatory system that increases the exploitation of women and is associated with domestic violence. And this coincides with the broader context of, of financialization. So I'm writing a whole separate paper about the relationship between debt and dowry because it's so significant. And this is also tied to um, the issue of, of expensive weddings. So families are getting into ex exorbitant amounts of debt because of this and, and, and the wedding industry. So with financialization, um, in real estate speculation, there are huge amounts of cash that um, people want to lend, and often it's for weddings and, and to the poor. Um, so there's a very interesting religious discourse that is actually challenging the debt economy. And this comes from the Islamic prohibition of giving and taking interest, and the idea that it's a sin to make money off of money. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to go into theological debates around this, but I, I can say a bit in the, in the discussion. Um, so here we have a, a local bank that, that recently announced uh, that it would do interest-free banking and loans specifically to, um, to cater to, to the Muslim community. Um, so my highly... Uh, secular activists in the field I identify as Muslim, um, but they don't like to use any religious discourse. So I find that they end up advocating financial inclusion um, for minorities, like better access to banks, which are less predatory than these informal lenders, which are important reforms, but they're not actually questioning the entire system. Whereas religious activists are actually having these kind of interesting moral debates. So this is a conversation between um, a Muslim middle-class activist woman and a low-income woman, woman who has, who has debts. Um, so Nuzet, the, the activist, says, money made from corruption or, or interest does not have any baraka, divine blessings. Um, Anis Fatima, the debtor, says, well, very few people believe that. Nuzet says, 
It's not a matter of belief. We will be called to account by God. Well, people don't give so much thought to life in the hereafter. They have a short-term vision. And as it says, but even in this life, corruption has its effects on not just the person, but his family too. Well, we have to make extremely tough choices to make interest payments, but it's a sin for you to make those payments. I know, but I do it out of helplessness, but your earnings will lose their buttaka. And finally, Anis Fatima gives in and says, you're right. So stay away from it as much as possible. Eat less if you have to. Um, so you see here that Nuzet um, is encouraging her to not pay, basically debt refusal. And uh, Anis Fatima is scared of committing the sin, the sin being actually making your payment. Um, but she also pushes back against the religious lecturing because she knows that she doesn't have a choice. So on the extreme end of this debate um, is a prominent activist named Alim Falaki, um, who had lived in Saudi Arabia for 20 years. And he has this boycott campaign, um, boycotting weddings entirely and pledging to not participate. And he's attracting a, a number of followers. Um, this is him giving a speech um, at, at a mosque in the city. This is one of his pamphlets. Um, join the jihad, like the, the spiritual struggle, boycott marriages where, where a dowry is taken from the bride. Um, and so one of the moral arguments he makes is about the issue of status and honor, which, which anthropologists have argued is at the root of these expensive weddings. Um, parents trying to augment their social status by, by taking on these huge debts. And so he equates this um, to the sin of shirk, um, which is basically attributing God's powers to other people or, or things, and it's considered the gravest sin. So he says, um, if you start believing that your dignity, your honor comes from what other people think, that is shirk. Whether it's the member of parliament or an auto driver, these people are victims of this sinful logic. Um, and so Falaki also argues that, that dowry um, is used as a way to deny women their inheritance rights in Islam. So what frequently happens is upon the, is upon the death of her parents, um, a woman will go back and seek her inheritance. Um, and her brothers will often say, well, we gave you everything we had for your dowry, um, and then basically refuse her inheritance. So again, you know, this, this deeply debt-driven system um, conflicts with, with religious principles, and, and this is an important kind of um, moment of, of resistance. So there's a kind of dynamism here in this, in this debt economy that's, that's related to other political visions, you know, around doing away with marriage rituals and not falling victim to, to sin um, and to the banks. So this kind of um, interest-free and, and wedding-free capitalism remains very unrealistic, I think, in India, but it's part of the, the radical imaginary in this city. Um, and the last thing I'll say about, about this case um, is that everyday people do resist through what David Graeber calls their baseline communism. So I heard of neighbors congregating at the hospital and kind of forcefully demanding a lower fee for a child's operation, people paying for the school fees of their nieces and nephews, and the many friends who, who lend money without interest. Um, so these types of resistance are, are not enough, um, but they're extraordinarily resilient. Okay. Um, so let me just take the last five minutes to, to pull together some conclusions from all of these different vignettes and examples. I, I know it was a lot. Um, so debt and the domination that it inflicts on, on poor and middle-class families is clearly a global problem. And um, one of the questions in the literature is to what extent do debtors constitute a class? or stated differently, you know, could debt actually be like a unifying axis of oppression 
that brings people together in, in a movement against financialized capitalism or even into an anti-capitalist movement. And I can say as part of an organization that tries to promote this perspective, there are definitely challenges. Um, one of the challenges that I've observed is, is how to bring together scholars and activists from both the, the sovereign debt perspective, people that you know, are dealing with the IMF, um, and the micro household level perspective toward a coherent explanation that, um, that ties together financialization and the everyday suffering of an individual or a family. So we could say almost by design that these financial systems and operations are utterly confusing um, and it becomes very difficult to make those connections. You know, what does a financial derivative have to do with, um, you know, this, this person in, in Kenya and the phone app, um, let alone see what it has to do with imperialism and race and gender all at the same time or, or in different ways. I think it takes a lot of analytical work and intellectual and pedagogical work. Um, people are certainly doing it. I, I think it's amazing in the Spanish case, I mentioned that they were able to do some of that work and, and communicate it within, uh, within communities. The other challenge is the sort of classic tension, I, I think, between um, reform versus a revolutionary approach. So we know that things cannot change overnight. Um, debt is a necessary part of our capitalist world. This is just reality. Um, what would be the consequences of a, of a massive financial collapse? Um, which means that the types of activist policy demands may be more reformist about banks being less predatory and more regulated, as I pointed out as the main demand in my, in my India case versus those who take a more sweeping approach and use the language of abolition um, and socialism. So one of the issues is that even demands that appear very radical, like, like jubilees, you know, debt cancellation, leave intact the roots of the problem, which is the lack of public goods. So, and then beyond that, stagnant wages and the lack of labor rights and affordable housing. So, you see how these things are so deeply um, in interconnected. Which brings me to the question of alternatives. Um, the more accessible type of alternative economic projects tend to be like peer lending at, at a neighborhood level, which is actually very common in, in much of the global South. Um, Interest-free lending, which actually requires a lot of startup capital um, better access to bank loans that are less predatory. But ultimately, alternatives to, um, to debt would involve solidarity economies based on cooperatives and things like community land trusts. And then there's the, at a more macro level, there's the issue of reparations, you know, within borders and from the global north to the global south. Um, this might involve everything from land reform to uh, to global patent reform, vaccine distribution. Um, so again, these are very large um, demands. Um, and the last point I'll make is that, you know, debt clearly connects to so many other forms of domination, like incarceration, as I mentioned earlier, like the gendered exploitation of a system like dowry, um, foreclosures and evictions. So in that respect, debt resistance includes many other forms of resistance to capitalism, if you will, from experiments in Islamic banking to the anti-dowry movement to anti-foreclosure actions. And it involves various levels of resistance from legal activism to direct action on the streets. And I guess the question um, is, you know, what is the potential of, of international debt resistance? What can we reasonably hope to accomplish? Um, what is it that can come from a more united and self-identified movement across the global North and South? Um, so I'm gonna stop there. Um, I'd just like to invite you to please share any of your reactions, um, lessons that you think we might take away, any comments um, and any, any questions, I will do my best to, uh, to engage.
Thank you so very, very much. You've given uh, an overview with a lot of examples and very important reflections and questions for us. Um, I've asked people uh, to type in their questions in the chat or the, or the Q&A, but I, I will start off uh, myself to begin with. Um, so uh, you make a very interesting um, um, structure of um, the uh, resistance in the form of the ideological uh, struggle, uh, the challenge against the institutions and uh, the lenders, the system, and the creation of alternatives. It seems to me that that's a very useful way of dividing it um, up. And also that it seems like there are connections, right? You need to kind of have an ideological struggle in order to make people ready to challenge, right? Um, for some of this is seen as normal and legitimate debts. Um, so you need to ideologically challenge some of this uh, predatory system in order to make people ready to challenge, right? But it also if people are going to challenge, they need to, uh, see some alternatives I need to have somewhere else to turn. Uh, so there, there seems to be a connection between the three uh, parts here. Uh, you think you could say something about that? What, how you see the connections between these dimensions or so? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me like, um in some ways the, the question of alternatives is, is a little bit um, disconnected, I think right now from, um, from the more immediate demands of like debt restructuring and debt abolition. Um, so in some ways that would be such an enormous transformation just in itself, you know? So like right now, for example, just getting the IMF to cancel some of the loans um, from poor countries, even during the pandemic, is is so difficult, right? So I think that struggle of showing, you know, why are the why is this illegitimate to demand, you know, from Ecuador or Haiti to pay, you know, billions of dollars at, the, at this moment? Um, that that's such an immediate kind of issue. That then taking the next step of like the solidarity economies and co-ops, I think it's it's harder to make those connections, but but ultimately it, it has to be done because unless we address the root causes, you know, which has to do with, with these larger economic structures, um, it, it's just gonna keep, you know, um, just keep repeating itself with different cycles. So yeah, I, I don't know if I really got to your question, but just, yeah. No, I, I see what you mean. I mean, it's, um, it's, making those connections would, would make a huge difference in itself, right? To, um, to connect these things. Um, it, it seems to me that um, the, uh, uh, the resistance must be so different when we are talking about what is perceived as being extreme depth that is seen by widely by people as being illeg illeg illegitimate, um, illegal even, and leading to debt bondage or so on the one hand. And the other hand, where it's more like seen as part of the normality or legitimate debt. Um, isn't that uh, kind of one of the challenges here to kind of, um, make people see um, <clears throat> that um, that can be um, very, very troublesome for, for people uh, without being so extreme that people even go to, to suicide, which is, I mean, a hor horrific uh, consequence of, of, of the debt system. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we're far away from that, aren't we? I mean, um, to see the normality of debt as being something that is um, possible to question. Mm -hmm. Ma maybe this, this is not really, it's, it's more a reflection. Uh, yeah. I don't know what you want to say something about that. 
Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I'd love to hear from others too, but um, <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. I mean, so David Harvey, for example, I mean, he, um, I mean, he refers to the, you know, our economy basically as one of debt peonage, you know, so, um, so, so basically debt bondage. I mean, you know, what, what does it mean that, um, you know, you've had to take $200,000, you know, in, in loans um, to get an education for an uncertain economic future, and you will spend probably the rest of your life, you know, pay, paying that off, like, in what way does that actually foreclose um, your, your future, and we, we can think of this as, as a form of, of bondage. Um, it, it's not only, you know, um, some of the people I study where they, where they literally go into debt bondage, you know, paying brokers in order to get to Dubai, you know, um, where they're not even properly paid as migrant workers, you know, um, and they live their lives in, in debt bondage like that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, making those connections between an American student debtor, you know, and, and this person in a poor community in India, it might seem problematic. Um, and yet to understand that this is actually the structure of, of, our, of our financialized economy right now, um, I think is really important. I think the movement is definitely making this argument that you know th this is extreme period. Um, there's some exceptions like in Scandinavia where people actually ha high, have high amounts of debt, right? But they're for mortgage debts um, and they have a very robust welfare state that, you know, um, takes care of them in, in times of need. So those are considered like good debts, right? But, but I would say that that's, I believe that's very much the exception. I, I don't know if others have a couple of questions. There were a couple of things that were emailed. Right. So uh, in, in the emails uh, from the registrations, we have um, uh, some questions. That's correct. Um, so one of them is, uh, can you help uh, to give a bit of a historical perspective on the acceptance of debt and usury in the Muslim uh, world? Right, I, I saw that. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if the, the um, person is here. Um, so, <laughs> no, I mean, unfortunately, I can't. I, I don't have that kind of um, knowledge of, of Islamic history um, necessarily. Um, but I would say that, you know, I mean, the, these communities, I mean, they they have their ethical, moral, ethical framework um, that's very important to them. And it's not, um, you know, usury is, is banned in a number of religious traditions, I, I believe, you know, um, and, but in these communities that I studied, it's not like an abstract, you know, um, concept. It's something that they very much grapple with, that they really do believe participating in the system is, is actually sinful. Um, you know, but they exist in the modern world. Um, they live in a situation where they don't have a choice but to participate in this. Um, and, you know, I, in my research, I came across so many cases where, I mean, that, that's their insurance system, you know, so that loan shark is the person that's going to give them the money to, to save their child's life, you know, in, in the hospital, um, in, in the absence of, you know, socialized um, risk, right, in the absence of, of a welfare state. Um, so I, I think it's really, it, the emphasis should be less about kind of cu culture and religious culture and more about the political economic structures that they have to exist in. But I'm also saying that it, it's their religious framework that in, in many ways gives them the tools to actually um, to resist and to, to undo some of this. Right, and, and an important part of that must be to, to hear about the examples of what people have done that you have um, told about, uh, which can be inspiring, um, what people have done in some part of the world uh, where cancellation actually was successful and, and where even the toppling of a government uh, in Iceland where um, corrupt bankers were, were put in jail. Um, so these kind of things can 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 um, 
can inspire uh, across cultures, right? Um, yeah. One thing that seems to me to be uh, key is to uh, figure out ways of going from the individual or small group um, uh, resistance to more collectively organized forms of resistance or alternatives. Um, do you see any kind of pattern of those cases where they are succeeding? Why are they succeeding to do it more collectively when, when they do it? Um, is, is there like something you tentatively can see uh, seems to matter? Yeah, um, <clears throat> just a quick point, um, going back to the, to the theological thing. Um, one of the things to um, one of the theological concepts um, is not just that interest is prohibited, but also the idea of, um, of sharing risk. And so, um, so the idea being that, you know, nothing good there's there's no profit without risk you know not you don't get any gain without actually taking a risk and that that risk has to be shared um and so you know so lending and debt is still going to happen um so there's a the question of interest but also you know how, how do we actually share that risk when um when a creditor lends to a debtor and so i think that's another kind of you know ethical framework that um is very interesting um yeah, so moving from kind of individual individuals defaulting on their loans to a collective movement. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I think um, the the Spanish case that I talked about was is quite interesting. Um, I think what seemed most powerful, and maybe also in the Bolivian case, um, was the face to face organizing and people actually over time um, spending spending time in in communities and discussing face to face in these general assemblies where they really built up an identity and, and started to gain confidence and you know shift their consciousness around these things. Um, obviously this is difficult in the pandemic um, and it raises other issues too about this idea our, our debtors class, you know, um, there is not, as some writers have, you know, have said, there's not like a factory floor, you know, that, that we're sharing, right? So some of this might be online, um, and then it raises these other questions of how how powerful can that can that be? Like, what is the potential of that um, when we don't have like a shared physical space? Um, the Iceland example is interesting. My my understanding of it, um, based on what I read, is it was a little, it was a more spontaneous kind of um, protest movement and and it led to a massive like government refusal to pay you know um but i don't know kind of how much it, it was sustained you know right now i believe it's just in the courts um so i'm not sure if it really became a sustained movement right there there, there are some some research on the icelandic uh, uh, revolution that that might shed some light on that um i i also don't know too much about that but um i think it's a very interesting example um we do have a question here from jan um uh, in the chat are, are there any statist allies to cancel debt um, um and and support resistance or are they mostly allies to the capital Right. Um, so if, if I understand the question um, correctly, it, it may not be. Um, are, are there members of the of, of government who, who actually support that resistance? Um, yeah, and that's if I understand that question correctly, um, I think that, that's a great question. Um, I mean, of course, it varies everywhere. And I mean, in, in general, um, I think in a lot of these cases, like like in Iceland, I mean in India, you know, there, I mean this is Lenin's thousand threads, right? So, um, so the state and capital are deeply, you know, al allied with each other. Um, so I think it's more the um, the exceptional politicians that that might support things like debt cancellation. But often it's the government officials that are um, negotiating these 
you know, some of these debts. I mean, when you're talking about Global South um, and the IMF, the question there's such an enormous power imbalance there um, that you know is important to factor in. Um, but I think the whole concept of like the forensic debt audit is precisely to show that you know politicians were were um, in some cases accepting bribes or or profiting off of these um, negotiations with private banks. Um, yeah, I think at the at the international level, like with international governance, I mean, there's like independent experts. Um, there's certain UN agencies that are that are very critical, um, and that you know promote debt cancellations. Could I maybe tag on to that question and and think a little bit uh, freely here? So there, there was an initiative that got the Nobel Peace Prize a couple of years ago, uh, banning the, the personal mines uh, as, as a particularly horrific type of weapon. Um, that started off by an alliance between uh, some NGO activists and some progressive states that wanted to have a, um, a ban of these personal mines. And they, they formed like a coalition that was growing over the years. And, and with time, they, they took initiative to a conference. And that conference um, suggested a new international law for uh, banning these mines. Could you see anything of that being a possible strategy forward here? That maybe some of these debt international co coalitions could could then form alliance with some progressive states to uh, come with an initiative of a new legal framework on an international level, or is that utopian thinking? Um, I don't know very much about it, but I, I don't think it's utopian at all. I mean, I think the type of conversations that are happening with with this organization I mentioned, the Progressive International. I mean, I think. They're trying to find, you know, progressive, you know, um, people who believe in debt justice um, from all sorts of different angles. You know, um, I mean, actually, Progressive International. I think that one of the original momentums of this came from the Bernie Sanders campaign, um, and I think in the case of the um, the debt collective in the U.S., I mean, trying to capture the attention of politicians has been really important. Um, so I, I don't think it's it's utopian. No. All right. So we have a question here from David. Uh, let's see here. Um, I'll read here. It seems to me the challenge of the emerging world and the first world face the same challenges, except the debt has been nationalized. And we know nationalized debt causes long-term problems. So do you think the problem is the same, but just larger sums and a longer time period before we all face the challenge. Is it any different than the Great Depression? Uh, the way I un interpret this is that it connects to what, what you describe of the increasing um, debt percentage of the uh, GDP for households and, and, and uh, governments, right? Right, right. Yeah, no, it's, it's a it's a complicated question. I mean, I'm 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 not equipped to really answer it with any kind of data, um, because when you look at like the the types of suffering you see in places in the U.S. and you know which communities are suffering, the fact that we actually have hunger, you know, um, something like twelve percent or something of, of Americans have faced like food scarcity. Um, you could make this argument of a, almost convergence. Um, but I think um, the reason I think it's important to maybe take a step back and not necessarily go in that direction is because, you know, the differences still between the, the South and the North are so are so extreme and the power imbalance is, is so extreme. Um, so for example, right now, I mean, the type of, it's very minimal, of course, but the type of, um, COVID relief, you know, that has been passed here is, is, is not happening in, in much of the world. And I think the history, you know, of why they're ill-equipped to actually, you know, like what's happening in India right now, um, when these post-colonial countries, you know, have had to take on so much debt to, um, to fund basic development projects, 
they were never able to kind of um, create like the health infrastructure that could, you know, the capacity that could handle a moment like this. And that in what we're seeing in some ways is a fallout, I think, you know, of the, I, don't, I don't know, the 30, 40 years of, of debt servicing, right? So I think, um, so if, you know, if I'm, if I'm interpreting your question um, the right way, um, I would be careful, I think, of making that kind of, of argument. Okay, so uh, we have a question here from Signe. Um, do you have any thoughts about how these movements can address the global circuits of finance, apart from targeting institutions like the IMF, um, the International Monetary Fund? It seems like most of these challenges are very much within a national context, yet many lenders, banks are transnational. Yeah, um, I, I don't, un unfortunately. I mean, not in terms of specific things, although I think that's exactly right. And, and I think I'm more just gonna reinforce your question, I think, rather than address it. Um, I think un understanding these global circuits is, is something that's been so difficult. Um, so literally naming these companies, like I think it was in the quote that I showed from Bolivia, um, where they, over this three month period on the streets and the universities, you know, they're, they're educating these peasants, you know, about how their microfinance debts actually connect to these international banks. And I think um, understanding those circuits and to some extent, like the sheer criminality behind, behind those flows um, is so important. Um, and I think for academics who are who are steeped in their in their different disciplines and studying their own corners, like in, including myself, um, uh, it becomes harder to to really turn these abstract things into a very concrete story, you know, that can be that can be communicated. Because I think once people understand, I think the moral outrage becomes um, much much stronger. But I, I would love to hear if anyone else, I don't know if they're able to participate, um, has any thoughts on that question. Yeah, we, we, we can allow people to speak. If, if you want to speak your question, you can, you can do that. Just uh, raise your hand in, in the Zoom and, and we can give you the, the, the mic. Uh, in the meantime, I can tag on to that uh, question. Um, I mean, in the 1980s, uh, there were uh, like a crisis in the international debt system when, when um, uh, countries like Mexico and, and a number of other pla places, the countries were, were so much in debt so that they refused to, to continue to pay. Um, uh, that, that was um, something that could have become more of an, of an uh, international of, of uh, uh, countries in the South um, to put pressure on the international banks. Uh, unfortunately, that led to, um, to um, um, individual negotiations and, and rescheduling of the debts, new, new loans to pay the debts, uh, all kinds of absurd uh, things. But um, I think to me, that speaks to the possibilities of involving the states um, that are also heavy debtors, at least some of the, the so-called developing states or poorer na nations. Um, so um, do we see anything of that uh, anymore, like a rebellion from, from uh, states uh, that, that feels like they are paying illegitimate, de illegitimate debts and they, they can't con continue to do that or they re refuse to do that. I mean, I'm thinking, for example, of many of the former French colonies that are still paying money to Paris um, as a compensation for the benefits of colonialism um, back to Paris, which, which is uh, not very known, but, but to me, it sounds like an outrageous and illeg illegitimate uh, debt. Um, do, we, do we see any rumblings or, among the states like that? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think, I believe so. I'm, I'm a little bit less on, on this um, literature in terms of sovereign debt, but I, I mean, there was a recent kind of crisis with Ecuador, 
Um, and so, yes, I, th I think there's a looming crisis with, with Pakistan right now. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, I don't know. I mean, other than kind of the now several years old, you know, um, situation in Greece, um, but I think it does it does happen. Um, but I think that the risk that a lot of countries face is that they have to be able to go back later on and take more debts. You know, and the fear right now with with um, the pandemic is that um, there's going to be so much re recovery, um, and there's been so much economic loss. I mean, the collapse of tourism is just one of these. You know, um, but resulting from the lockdown and things that they're they're most likely going to need um, more loans. Actually, um, in my understanding right now is that you know the IMF and the, the G20 countries are not actually willing to um, to cancel right now. So it's, I mean, I, I have heard, um, you know, if, if there was like a massive debt refusal, <laughs> let's just hypothesize, you know, on a on a global scale. Um, I think some some scholars are kind of scared of the consequences of that. You know, what kinds of suffering could that actually um, uh, could erupt? You know, from that. So, to some extent, you know, smaller scale reforms might be actually better. Um, I've seen that argument. And you mean that it would have uh, devastating effects for those uh, populations, those states? Uh, okay. Yeah. 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 Um, one of um, one of my um, a, a colleague, you know, has has argued, and um, Katharina Pistor, that she thinks there'll be like a, a legal pandemic um, when this is done, because you know everyone done, meaning you know in the aftermath of the pandemic, that um, you know all these different parties will be trying to negotiate their their debts, and so right. I don't see any hands uh, raised and, and no more questions. So uh, I'll ask um, the last uh, question then. Uh, oh, here comes one from Dan. Um, uh, the average European Union country has an 80% debt to GDP. Could mm -hmm. you talk about this? No, I... I Unfortunately, I can't, I can't. I apologize. Um, the the only thing that um, that it makes me think of, like I said, is is what I've learned a bit about um, some Scandinavian countries. And Stellan, I think you know a bit about this too, right? They actually have some of the highest rates of household debt, um, but but it looks very different in the context of of the welfare state. Um, it has very different consequences. Right. And as you say, if you have a debt that is connected to your house, um, then you have um, something of value connected to that as well. So it's, it's, it's a different thing. Um, what, what I was thinking of as the last question was more like, uh, I know that you are also uh, interested in has been doing work on, on political economy. Uh, so I was thinking about um, the debt system in itself, um, for me, that hasn't uh, looked very much into political economy. Is it is it correct to understand that debt is very functional on two levels? One is for the lenders, of course, that they can earn money on money, so it's kind of easy uh, for bankers and and uh, be that legal or illegal um, uh, lenders. Um, but it's also very uh, functional for capitalism as such, uh, because it forces individuals and families and, and even states to earn more money and to be part of the circulation of money. So it becomes more difficult to opt out and create socialist alternatives uh, in itself. Debt is kind of not just putting us in bondage um, in, the, in the way of, of having to pay, but also to participate in the capitalist economy. What, is that conspir conspiracy thinking of mine or is it, would, would you agree on such an analysis? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, 
I can't remember if I mentioned this earlier, but so, so you know, David Harvey argues that, um, uh, you know, capitalism by definition, like needs to continually grow, right? And, and now, I mean, the only way it actually grows is through the production of debt. Um, it's not through kind of state industries and, and things. Um, so, so yeah, in some ways, the collapse of the debt system would, would in many ways be the collapse of, of, of capitalism. Many people have argued that, I think. Um, and it's also related to some extent to um, like the neoliberal subjectivity you know, the fact that we all individually carry this debt, we have to, to, to survive. Um, we have certain desires that have been created over generations, you know, in terms of having a mortgage and having a home. Um, we don't have a choice in terms of taking on education and, and things. Um, and yet we do all this as individuals, right? And so it, like in my India research, people are individually negotiating with their financer you know, there's there's really not this sense of of we're like a debtors union, you know, which which is what the movement is trying to to promote. Um, so yeah, so around the issue of subjectivity, that we're all individuals and morally accountable and have to pay our debts, you know, is also very compatible with with continuing this this system and reproducing capitalism and allowing it to grow. So with that, we are uh, now at the end of this. And, and I want to thank you very much, Farin Parvez, for presenting uh, this for us. Um, it's, um, it's a pedagogical um, necessary work to, to make us all understand these complex things better, because we are, as you have shown very clearly, um, embedded in this and the consequences are profound uh, for societies and individuals and families. Um, so finding ways out of uh, uh, these systems seems so incredibly necessary, but uh, part of it is also for us to understand it better. And I want to thank you for helping us to understand it better and also see some of these insp inspirational examples. Um, so thank you so much for um, this and um, uh, the recording will the, hopefully be um, available for participants uh, later on as well. And um, with that, thank you so much. Um, thank you. And I want to uh, highlight that we do have uh, another uh, webinar coming up uh, on um, the 13th of May, um, which is on indigenous resistance in Alaska. Um, more, on, more on that on our website. So thank you so much. Thank you.